uh, just before Nuremberg, uh, and tell me what brings oh, you there. Okay, you? I uh, <clears throat> I have a curvature of the spine, yep. and so uh, when I was uh, at Yale Law School, I wasn't able to get in any of the services. So right. we were on an accelerated program, and I finished in uh, in March of '43, yep. and went with a law firm in uh, New York City, which was then called Devavoy Stevenson. Clinton and Page. No, I know it well. Oh, it's a great firm. Uh, yeah. Wonderful uh, yeah. uh, people. And I worked uh, pretty closely uh, uh, for three years then with uh, with uh, Whitney Devavoy's right. and uh, uh, Bob Page and yeah. with Bill Stevenson until he left be, to be uh, at the uh, American Red Cross. Right. And uh, uh, a lot with, uh, with Francis Plimpton, who... Uh, Yes. You know, later was uh, 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 at the UN under uh, Adley Stevenson. Right. We were college and law school uh, yeah. roommates, and also uh, with Ed McLean, who was a partner then. And yeah. Ed was a uh, a great friend, and later on uh, handled the uh, the Alger Hiss case. Right. So it was a wonderful uh, term and good experience. Well, in any event, uh, I was having lunch one day in uh, in February of '46 with a friend of mine from uh, the Millbank firm, yep. I think it was Millbank or Davis Polk, in any event, uh, he had with him a, uh, a friend of his who had, was back from uh, Nuremberg recruiting additional uh, lawyers for, uh, 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 primarily for the uh, uh, the later trials, the sub subsequent proceedings. Yep. So uh, I can't remember the fellow's name at, uh, at, the, uh, at the moment, but in any event, uh, I perked up my ears. Yep. And inside of, uh, oh, February, God, uh, uh, I landed in uh, Nuremberg on May 10th of uh, 46. Yeah. So in the meantime, I, I went down to, uh, to uh, Washington, and was, was interviewed by, uh, uh, God, that great uh, Colonel uh, uh, Mickey Marcus. Yeah. And, uh, of course, it was curious that when I came back from... Uh, from Nuremberg in May of 48, the first headline I saw in the Daily News was Colonel Mickey Marcus dead, shot, uh, you know, by uh, uh, ambush there as part of the uh, uh, the Israeli uh, oh, yeah. Arab War, yeah. where he didn't know the, uh, hell, he had trained the Israeli army, but he yeah. didn't know the password or something. So uh, we got there, and uh, uh, I was assigned to... Uh, uh, work on the case against the general staff and high command. So yeah. I guess uh, pretty much there the wasn't a heck of a lot uh, uh, doing except uh, to read all the uh, the previous uh, transcript of what had uh, yeah. had occurred, which I did, and uh, attended a lot of the court sessions and uh, found the whole thing uh, fascinating. But uh, uh, then the various uh, documents led to this uh, chain of events against the... Uh, uh, what they did in southeastern uh, Europe when they right. invaded uh, Greece and uh, Yugoslavia. Yeah. Yeah. And we had captured all of the uh, 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 people, beginning with Field Marshal uh, List, who was in uh, commander-in-chief at the uh, outbreak of the war there in right. uh, in uh, September of 41, yeah. uh, Yugoslavia. And the uh, case that I uh, then tried, we had representatives of the Greek government mm -hmm. and of the Yugoslav government as uh, assigned uh, as part of our trial. And mm -hmm. that was interesting because uh, God, a lot of the stuff, of course, that was uh, happening was that the uh, Serbs and the Croats were battling uh, yeah. each other and killing yeah. more people, more of each other than they were of Germans. Yeah. And the same thing with the, uh, uh, in, in Greece, uh, with the civil war and the rivalry going on. Yeah. So, uh, Let's see. So uh, the overlap uh, was that uh, when the trial, the main trial ended, those of us who were staying on had an opportunity yep. to talk with the defendants. So I had a fascinating uh, hours conversation in English with uh, with Goering and uh, with Schock and with Keitel and uh, Schock spoke in English as well, but Keitel and Yodel in, uh, in German. But the uh, the fascinating thing about uh, conversation with Goering, I, yeah. I put in to, to talk with him uh, primarily uh, to see if he knew anything about uh, the southeastern uh, Europe, and it turned out he, he really didn't because he yeah. 
was pretty much out of things from uh, the middle of 43 on when uh, uh, Bormann uh, got uh, Hitler's uh, ear. So, um, uh, but in the course of the conversation, uh, uh, at the tail end of the, uh, the hour period, I said to him, uh, Field Marshal, have you any idea where Martin Borman might be? Ah, oh, yes, he says. Uh, Borman, you know, he was always kind of a left-wing Nazi. <laughs> Imagine that, a left-wing Nazi. So I said, yeah, well, would, you, would you go on to develop uh, why that? Well, he said, I'm satisfied that he was captured by the uh, Soviets during the Battle of uh, Berlin. And he said, you mark my words, in uh, short order, he'll be appearing as head of a uh, Soviet-dominated dominant, uh, dominated, uh, no, German public did. government. No, so I took this back, told Telford Taylor, and he said, well, that's an interesting. Uh, Borman was uh, popping up in the Alps and all <laughs> over the place, and, uh, and he said, I don't think there's anything to it, but uh, let me send somebody else down again. So the day or two later, uh, another uh, lawyer went down and, and uh, again got the... Uh, uh, conversation at the end uh, around the, where Borman might be, yeah. and Kerry said, "Oh yeah, he's with uh, Perone in uh, in Argentina." <laughs> and he went on to develop that. <laughs> That's and some... the third guy, time, time, got he had uh, he had Borman with Franco in Spain. <laughs> so we mentioned this to uh, to uh, Gilbert, the psychiatrist. Oh, he said, "That's typical uh, uh, Goering. He has no more idea than where than any of the rest of us do where <laughs> Borman is, but anything to." Uh, to make a big splurge and be flamboyant and uh, get out of the prison for a while. That's a great story. Uh, but it was a wonderful uh, anecdote. Now, Schacht was uh, very interesting, and uh, he told about, I, uh, uh, at the tail end of the, of the conversation, I said, uh, uh, Herr Schacht, if you had to put your finger on the uh, one uh, event of anything else that brought about World War II, what would it be? Oh, he said the Munich Agreement of, of 38. And he went on to, to develop you know about the conspiracy they had and uh, uh, according to shock uh, yeah. they were having uh, one of their final meetings in the uh, office of, uh, of von Braukic, yeah. the chief of the army and uh, when his aide de camp and he said uh, Braukic was about to go over to the right chancery and tell Hitler he had to uh, resign and uh, he said just as he, he did by his aide de camp came in and said uh, Phil Marshall uh, there's a very important announcement coming over the uh, German radio, and he said, we sat there, about uh, a dozen of us, uh, listening to the announcement that Deladier was coming from Paris and Chamberlain from, uh, from London uh, to negotiate with the Fuhrer over the Sudetenland. Yeah. And he said, uh, we knew what that meant, uh, and uh, not only would we have uh, uh, nobody on our side in uh, the event of a revolt, but he said, among ourselves, we began to have some doubts as to whether this and didn't have some kind of occult yeah. power. Yeah. So it was a fascinating uh, uh, account. And he said, uh, 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 Shock then uh, said very perceptively, I thought, he said, uh, you mark, uh, again, you, you uh, mark my words, he said, within a, a matter of uh, months, the Soviets will make their bid in uh, Czechoslovakia, and uh, that betrayal of the Sudetenland uh, yeah. will have so... Uh, uh, turn them uh, off against you that there'll be no uh, resistance uh, whatever and uh, sure enough uh, if I uh, March of uh, 47 I guess uh, Badish and uh, and uh, Masaryk uh, were out of the picture either pushed or yep. suicide or off the parapet there and oh, yeah. the Soviets took over but it was, uh, so that was the kind of the uh, the overlap that I I, I had well, let me let me uh, ask you a couple of uh, further questions about the Gehring conversation. Yeah. Can you place that as uh, precisely as as your memory permits in time? The conversation would have taken place, uh, I think, probably in September. What I'm trying to f figure out is, uh, do you have this expansive conversation with Gehring before or after he knows he's been found guilty and sentenced to death? Oh, before. It is before. before. Oh, yeah. So yeah. his, his mood it was before. After the uh, uh, right, it was be, it was the before the decisions came down because I think once the decisions came down, I don't think anybody uh, was allowed to interrogate him. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, we weren't. Yeah. Now I take it you did this in the interrogation room in the in the yeah, prison block. Yeah, right. God, Goering came in with two black MPs uh, uh, and Fred Kaufman was the. Uh, 
interpreter and we sat there in this sparse room with this little table and he came in and he clicked his heels and bowed from the waist and waited for me to motion for him to sit down and I went to my spot. <laughs> happening here, I'm 27 years old and this man is waiting for me to motion for him to sit down, which I did and uh, yeah. offered him a cigarette and Fred Cuff and said, uh, oh, uh, Reichs Marshall, uh, would you like to speak in uh, German or English? Oh, he says English is okay. So he did speak so in English. He spoke in English. How, yeah, would you, how would you characterize his English? Very good. It was excellent. And, uh, you know, he's a very charming guy. So he I gather. A lot of personal so I gather. personality. Yeah, does, yeah. does this wit come through in English yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, it did. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, his uniform hung on uh, very limply. He was uh, uh, thin and emaciated. But uh, he had all his buttons and... Uh, uh, couldn't have been more uh, outgoing, and yeah. if you didn't know, he certainly would have taken me in, you know, on the on the uh, on the Borman thing. Uh, if you didn't know <laughs> that uh, the kind of personality he was. Well, con men are very convincing. Yeah, That's exactly. why they call him con. Oh, Jesus! Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. And then, were you there in the uh, at at Washington when this story came out about? Uh, about how he was smuggled a vial of poison by Texan. Well, you know, I've, I've read Swearingen's book and I've talked to him. Uh -huh. I wasn't, you know, Swearingen wrote that book uh, where he, he gives that account, oh, uh, maybe three or four years ago. How, how do you credit that story? Well, how about the fellow, what I'm thinking about is uh, uh, that night at the banquet when the man uh, said he had just had a letter within the last month from uh, from the niece of Emmy Goering confirming yeah. that uh, uh, the story. Well. Uh, you're, a, you're a lawyer, so you can probably think more analytically than I can about these matters. But uh, I, I, I'm assuming that Gehring was slipped that capsule uh, very near the end, and very likely by an American uh, GI, yeah. part of the security detail, which is Swearingen's contention. I buy that. But as far as this dramatic confirmation, I have this problem. Oh, uh -huh. um, Did Herman come back from the grave and tell his daughter, and his daughter told his niece? And, how the hell would they know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yes. it's, it's possible that Gehring would have said in a visit with, the, with his well, wife, he, I've got a deal well, cooked up with the GI, so don't worry, I'm going to be able to yeah. cheat the hangman. Right. It's possible. Well, and he apparently wrote, wrote, wrote Emmy a, a letter to that effect, which they have. Well, I'll have to call Swearinger, because that's not in his book. I see. That's a new edge. Okay, well, this was, uh, this was certainly, uh, you know... It, it, this fellow popped up in the audience just after Telford Taylor had delivered his uh, yeah. uh, analysis. You yeah. Know. Well, was it Ben Swearingen? Does that name? I, I don't think it was Swearingen. Well, maybe there's somebody else. I'll have to track yeah. that down. Yeah, Telford would know. Uh, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm going to be seeing him well, yeah, okay, in, the, yeah, in the fall. Okay. You know, one other, as long as I, I, I have you, one other curious thing that was, uh, I, I, met, I told it to Telford and he didn't, didn't uh, uh, know it. We had uh, the one American... Uh, the one German uh, field marshal that we had not captured was Alexander Lehr, L-O-E-H-R. Yeah. And uh, the Yugoslavs had him, so yeah. we wanted to uh, uh, extradite him. They wouldn't do it. Yeah. And so, well, can Fenstermacher uh, come down and interrogate him? Well, yeah. yes. So it was cleared on a very high uh, level through Ambassador Murphy in Berlin that Fred Kaufman and I were to mm. fly down to, uh, to Belgrade to interrogate uh, Lehr. Well, yeah. Uh, we flew to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Vienna, stayed overnight, and then at that time there was this three-mile-wide corridor that uh, yeah. uh, you couldn't stray out of. And just about two or three weeks before we were scheduled to fly, God, the uh, American plane strayed outside the corridor and, and was uh, forced down or shot yeah. down. I can't remember yeah. uh, which. So it was a little uh, uh, funny. But in any event, we we got there and. To me, uh, a landing in uh, Belgrade, the airport, all full of uh, big flags, uh, white, uh, red stars, and so on. And God, my, I was absolutely bug-eyed to see, uh, uh, in effect, to be behind the iron curtain. So we stayed at a at a hotel. Uh, Belgrade at that point, I haven't been back since, but it was just yeah. kind of a uh, overgrown uh, little uh, rural rural community. Yeah. And uh, uh, we'd look around in the hotel and try to. A lot of Russian uh, people there trying to figure out who was the NKVD man and, and so on. And reported to the ambassador yeah. the uh, next morning. We got there on a Monday morning, reported to him the next morning. Oh, he said, yeah, we're 
inspecting you and so on. So he uh, called up the uh, foreign office. Uh, well, foreign, nobody over there, foreign minister, nobody able to talk today and uh, call back tomorrow. So uh, call back uh, uh, Wednesday. No, this is a matter being handled by the uh, by the military uh, department, the War Department. So uh, nobody around here today. We've got to call back tomorrow. Next day, uh, let's see, on uh, Thursday, uh, we get another runaround. It's not handled be by the State Department or their foreign office or yeah. the military, but by the Justice Department. So uh, nobody around. And uh, so we report again uh, Friday morning uh, to the uh, uh, embassy. One last uh, time, because we got to get ourselves right. the hell back to Nuremberg instead of just wasting time down there. At at 12 o'clock noon, it, it was almost as if the diplomatic courier stood outside the, the door yep. waiting for the gong to ring. This uh, dispatch comes in from the uh, foreign office uh, addressed to the uh, American ambassador and, and so on and in response to the uh, uh, proposed interrogation of, uh, of Colonel General uh, uh, Alexander Lur by Theodore Frentz Tabaka and Frederick Kaufman of the Office of Chief of Counsel for War Crimes in Nuremberg, we beg to advise as follows. The fascist general uh, Alexander <laughs> Lur was uh, captured by the heroic uh, armies of the People's Republic of Yugoslavia on such and such a date. Uh, he was uh, uh, brought to trial for uh, heinous uh, war crimes. Uh, he was convicted uh, and sentenced to be uh, shot uh, and uh, the uh, is, uh, sentence was carried out on such and such a date, which was before we had oh, left uh, to come down. Oh, well, right. <laughs> we were disappointed, but the ambassador said, uh, uh, you know, that's not, don't be alarmed. I don't think there was any bad faith involved. This is a new government. Uh, one department doesn't know what the hell the other is doing. Yeah. So I think it was simply a kind of a internal screw up. Nobody was intending to, uh, uh, to mislead you. That's uh, a hell of a story. Uh, funny story. I got another question, another question about Gehring. Yeah. Uh, since you were poking around for evidence in, uh, I guess, southeastern Europe yeah. for the subsequent trials, were you aware that Gehring had a brother who was working, I think, uh, as a businessman in Hungary uh, or one of the other Balkans? Did that come up at all? No. Yeah. No, never okay. knew that. Yeah. Never uh, knew that. Your conversations with Gehring, Schacht, and Keitel, were they all related to this uh, objective of, of they began that that way to yeah. see what what uh, what they knew, if anything, about right. particularly uh, right. during what he knew about yeah. uh, about the southeastern uh, uh, Europe and the military people involved. Right. And primarily, it was an excuse uh, when you get right down to it for me to to talk with people that I uh, I, I just wanted to. Uh, I guess 50 years later, be able to say I had, oh, I had talked with him. You were a part of history. Yeah. yeah and right. you, at least you had the perspective right. to recognize it. You know, yes. Well, yeah. I tell you, I, uh, I have written a number of books, particularly on the World War II uh -huh. era, and I've interviewed literally hundreds of people yeah. as a result. The thing that always impresses me is how there are certain uh, of my witnesses, if, if I may call them that, yeah. who have a sense of the moment, uh -huh. that this is history, and others yeah. are oblivious of yeah. it. They don't even know they're living history. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway. You know, one curious thing uh, about, oh, God, I guess it's got to be maybe four or five years ago time passes. I was down trying a, a case in the courthouse here and came back at noontime, and there was a message to call uh, CBS TV, some yes. number and name. And I called, and here it was a, uh, a woman wanted to know... Um, did I know that one of the documents introduced into evidence in uh, my case had been signed by, uh, uh, who's the fellow from Austria, the president of Austria? Oh, uh, my God, here? Kurt, uh, Kurt Waldheim. Uh, Waldheim. I said, uh, no. Well, she said, uh, uh, yes, it was a document number so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, do I have it? I said, no, I don't have copies of all the documents. Well, uh, yeah. uh, uh, she gave me a name of somebody in the, oh, uh, some Jewish uh, uh, group, and eventually I got a copy of the document, which was illegible, but it turned out that uh, he apparently had signed this as a as a staff officer, yep. and the document itself we had introduced, 
because it uh, uh, indicated the a report from one of the uh, uh, divisions up to headquarters showing mm -hmm. about the uh, execution of hostages at the uh, 100 to 1 and 50 to 1 ratios. Right. But uh, then she went on to say, "Did what did I personally believe about uh, Waldheim? If he was there, did he have any knowledge of uh, the execution of hostages? But they were primarily interested in the deportation of, of mm -hmm. Jews. And I said, well, obviously, uh, because the, the, we captured uh, photographs of that German soldiers had taken, and I remember one in particular showing uh, 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 people hanging, bodies hanging from the street street lamps, yeah. and the caption was, uh, uh, I've forgotten the German, uh, flowers in bloom in the spring. Oh my God. Oh, it's gruesome. Yeah. That's terrible. What do you recall about your visit with Keitel? Not a heck of a lot, except that he, he didn't seem terribly... Uh, Right, Yodel was uh, was very bright. And, well, you talked uh, to Yodel as well. Yeah. yeah, very bright and very upfront. I mean, uh, Keitel was a kind of a uh, uh, oh wimpy or uh, kind of fellow with with uh, he was handsome uh, and yeah. impressive looking, yes. but pretty uh, not sharp uh, and made kind of a lot of excuses and you know really didn't stand up for what he believed. Yodel, on the other hand, was up front. I, I disagreed with the Fuhrer in a lot of uh, yeah. things, but I'm a military man. I was yeah. trained that way. I did. I was. I was. I told. I'm the failest. I'm the fail, and, right. and so on. But uh, I was impressed by him. A very bright, able uh, to try to hide yeah. uh, anything. In going into the uh, cells, Ted, uh, did you have to uh, work through uh, Colonel Andrus? Yeah, right. Well, uh, he's a character I want to write about at yeah. to some length. Maybe you can refresh your recollection. Well, I don't, I don't remember uh, much about him except one of the. Uh, I, I had a brief encounter with him because one of the uh, 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 people that we had indicted, uh, General Franz Burma, was a right. real butcher yeah. in uh, in uh, Greece and Yugoslavia, mm. and we captured him. And uh, as soon as the indictment, within a day or two after the indictment was served mm. on him. God, he jumped uh, off one of the, uh, uh, in the jail, oh, and plunged down uh, four or five stories and, and killed himself. And so uh, we were uh, annoyed uh, that the, uh, uh, that had been allowed to happen. And so I guess, I've forgotten how it was, I guess maybe Telford Taylor and I uh, briefly saw him and he said that as a result we're going to have uh, better precautions on, so. Well, this is was this before or after the executions of the major criminals? This was this would have been after. Well, it was after. After, right? So this is his third, right. the third. Uh, yeah, who he loses. Third boo -boo, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was yeah. this officer's name again? The German. Uh, uh, the general was Franz Burma, B O E H M E. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, how did uh, Andrus strike you? What stays in your memory about him? Not a heck of a lot, yeah. uh, Joe, not a heck yeah. of a lot. One curious thing, though, Don, you're mentioning the jail. We went in one time, and I forgot who was with me, and as we walked by Hess's cell, yeah. I looked in the little uh, door, and he was sitting at his uh, uh, kind of desk there, yeah. uh, uh, eating. When he saw that he was being uh, looked at, by God, he picked up his tin plate, threw it right at <laughs> the... Uh, at the uh, opening there. <laughs> See, it was funny. Uh -huh. Side on. As you come there as a civilian, uh, you wore civilian clothes? Yes. Well, we wore, uh, we were civilians, but we wore kind of a uniform. Without insignia. Without I insignia. Yeah. 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 And where did you live in Nuremberg? Well, we lived, uh, when I first went over, uh, another guy and I uh, lived at uh, the Grand Hotel. Yeah. And then we got barracks. Uh, we, we, uh, we were part of a, we, we had a house. There were about uh, six of us in this yeah. out, out in, uh, in Furt, right, right near where, uh, where Jackson's uh, right. uh, quarters were. Because yeah. I remember we played tennis on his tennis court. And, oh, he had uh, a court? Yeah. What, 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 let me, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a bear for detail, okay. which I have no right to ask after the oh, passage sure. of 45 years. What kind of a surface was it? Jesus, <laughs> I think it was a good one. I think it was a... Uh, you know, Clay, I'll be damned. we played on a, on a Sunday morning, and I remember Jackson, the justice wasn't there, but Bill was around. Yeah. Uh, Bill Jr. Right. Uh, 
And uh, then after that, when my wife came over, it was, like, it was an odd, uh, here I'm Pennsylvania Dutch and German, yeah. my family came, uh, uh, settled from the fall section of Germany, yeah. arrived in Philadelphia in 1736. Yeah. And both sides of my uh, family have been uh, German, Pennsylvania, Dutch descent ever since, yeah. but I never knew a word of German. I went over there and picked up enough uh, to get by on. Yeah. My wife, however, had uh, majored in German at Vassar. And so when uh, she came over, uh, we got uh, uh, a house. We got right. uh, the second floor of a house out uh, on, uh, oh, a little bit outside the main uh, portion of, uh, of, of Nuremberg. Yeah. And uh, we're there the rest of our, our time. When you, when you arrived in Nuremberg there in the early part of uh, 46, uh, you're one of these guys who was not coming from the battlefront. You're no. coming from a country that's unscarred Absolutely by the war. Absolutely. What's your reaction? Oh, my God, it was unbelievable, Joe. We landed in Bremerhaven, I think, a day or two, uh, yeah, two days after the yes. uh, uh, hostilities had, had ended a year before, a year right. two days before, right. May 8th. And uh, to take a train down through that devastated uh, portion of Germany, unbelievable. Yeah. I had never seen any such destruction. And that brings me to this one other little anecdote. I used to, uh, before my wife came over, I used to take walks in the old city of, uh, of Nuremberg. Yep. And one evening I was out there, uh, and uh, there's kind of a rise as you as you walk into the uh, old city, and right near a, a church, which had originally been a Catholic church, and yep. then after the Reformation became a uh, a Lutheran church. Yeah. There's a big statue of Kaiser Wilhelm I. Right. And uh, I was sitting there in this pile of rubble near the uh, uh, the monument, looking out, and you could look out over this terrible devastation. And a young German uh, veteran, I assume he had to be a veteran, who came up on, uh, on crutches yeah. and sat about uh, 15 feet away from me. And uh, I offered him a cigarette, and uh, uh, we talked a little bit English and my uh, crew German, we were able to have a kind of a, a, a conversation. And I yeah. said, uh, uh, he, he, he said to me, he said, uh, it's uh, pretty awful, isn't it, all this uh, destruction? Oh, I said, yeah. Well, he said, you know, it's so unnecessary. It all happened uh, here just a few months before the uh, war ended. Uh, Nuremberg had no military necessity. The war was really yeah. over. It was really uh, a terrible thing to, to do. Yeah. Oh, I uh, listened for a second. I said, uh, well, I, I suppose uh, Rotterdam doesn't lose. <laughs> so he uh, was quiet for a while. <laughs> and finally I said to him, uh, do you have any idea how long it'll take to, uh, to clean everything up? Oh, he said, uh, I don't know, 10 years. No, 20, 20, 20 years, yeah. 10 years. If we get a good leader, I think we can do it in five. Yes. <laughs> How Teutonic. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Like Absolutely. When you were in this early phase, to the high command case before the subsequent proceedings, who was your immediate superior? That was uh, Telford Taylor. What do you recall about him? What kind of a oh, boss was he? Oh, wonderful guy. Brilliant. Jesus, he could write like an angel. And uh, I think he and uh, Jackson, of course, could write like... The, the, yep. the, uh, to hear Jackson's closing address and Sir Hartley Shawcross's mm -hmm. closing address in person, and then to read uh, Jackson's opening address, uh, they were just superb. And mm -hmm. Telford Taylor uh, could write very well. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant guy. Very good. Excellent. Nice, nice, solid person. Could he lose his temper? I never saw him lose it. Yep. Uh, at that time, he was married to Mailer, Mary, Mary Taylor, and Mary, you know, his wife, uh, she was a, uh, a daughter of, uh, of Dean Landis, James Landis, uh, James Landis, who was the dean of the Harvard Law School, yeah. very distinguished. Yeah. They had, uh, when they were there, they had, uh, they had two daughters who were uh, quite young at, at that time, yeah. and they have since gotten divorced. But right. that, when I saw Telford in Washington, uh, he's got to be in the early 80s. Look, he is. Looks fine. Yeah, he is. He just right. finished. He's just finishing up a book. Uh, yes, what he told me. Yeah. 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 Um, very fond of him. 
the uh, case that you worked on initially, uh, did it strike you odd, uh, the idea of developing a case against an organization? Well, in a way it, it did, you know, in terms of uh, collective guilt and so on, but uh, I guess I just kind of did as I was told, yeah. uh, did the research, and it was all so fascinating to me. Yeah. God, it was just interesting as all hell to uh, really see history uh, 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 go back and, and knowing what we, we did and, and then to see the, uh, the documentation for it all. Yeah. Just so you were comfortable with the assignment? I was. Yeah. Uh, I, I remembered uh, initially having some misgivings because of, uh, of, of Taft's uh, uh, point of view, uh, ex post facto and so on. But right. after I got looking into it and uh, saw the explanation and the, uh, uh, learned a little bit about international law and the sources yeah. of international law myself, I never had any problems with that. As a uh, young civilian uh, employee, in effect, yeah. Would, would they pay a young lawyer to go over oh, to God, Denver? Oh, God, we got a lot of money. I've I forgotten bet. what it was. Uh, <laughs> but, and, uh, Must have been five figures. <laughs> no, it was like, uh, back then, it was like, I, well, I, I can remember when I got out of law school yeah. in March of uh, 40, uh, 43. Right. I started at $1,800 $1, yeah. a year, yeah. and in three months, I was bumped up to 2100 because yeah. I'd been on the uh, part of the... Uh, Law Journal, yeah. and then got raises. I think in in '48 when I left Devilwise, I might have been making uh, let's say five thousand, and I think the salary we got was like seven or seventy five hundred at, at, at Nuremberg. At Nuremberg, that's Plus damn the, good. Yeah, oh god, it was good. Wound up in in this uh, town of Cortland, twenty thousand, where I've loved it. I've been able to take on cases that. Uh, you know, I sue the First National Bank, of course, and I'm able to, <laughs> to sue the the establishment yeah. because I appreciate what a terrible thing it is for uh, uh, the, uh, if you're uh, a, a dissenter or, right. or if you're anti-establishment, you know, what the uh, pressures are. So That's I've always answer. been scared to death of and wary of power, no matter yeah. who the hell uh, has it. Well, Democrat, Republican, rich, poor, God, yeah. watch him. Watch the people in power. I uh, have just finished a uh, biography of uh, Justice Jack Book, uh -huh. but uh, the, and a, a great theme in his life is his wariness of the concentration yeah. of power in anybody's hands. Yeah. And, you know, I guess maybe he came from uh, Jamestown, and I'm, yeah, I, I went out there, and uh, I was out at, at Chautauqua last uh, summer, and, and as I came back uh, through Jamestown, I, I thought, God, what yeah. a wonderful... Uh, Man, he was, and, and I think part of that comes from growing up in a, uh, in a small town with a, a small town law practice where you fear, uh, where, you're, where you're pretty close to power, yeah. how it can be abused. Yeah. Did you have, I mean, you're, you're a young guy there, did you have much opportunity to observe uh, uh, Justice Jackson other than his performance in the court? No, because as a matter of fact, uh, he was not in. Most of that day-to-day -day work was done by, yeah. um, by Dodd. Did you know Tom Dodd at all? I knew him just slightly, but uh, there was kind of a gulf between those of us who were staying on and the uh, uh, and the major leaguers. Really. Yep, I got you. Yeah. Did you have much opportunity uh, or interest in, other than the one experience you gave me, of dealing with the German in the street, German civilians there? Uh, well, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd talk to uh, uh, the maid or... or various people that you'd run onto, and constantly you got this uh, this business about uh, Hitler. Uh, and I remember uh, being struck by it when, when Hess made his uh, final summation, yeah. you know, talking about, uh, then these steel gray eyes looked at me. And you, you hear that from, from people in the street that if, uh, uh, and parades in Nuremberg and so on, when Hitler had come down, he, yeah. he, he just... Uh, uh, captivated everybody, and then they'd be saying, well, we had no idea what was going on in the concentration camps and so on. And uh, in part, I think that was true. They, they yeah. didn't want to know. They were scared to death to know. But you'd finally, uh, the real shocker, you'd always say to them, well, you knew what was happening to the Jews, didn't you? You knew about the, uh, that they were wearing uh, uh, 
stars up yeah. Star of David. You yeah. knew that there were shop windows where were, were a battered. Of course, they all knew that. Yeah. But you know, I did indeed have a kind of sympathy sympathy with them because the once the Nazis got control of the streets, once they got yeah. rid of the uh, people like me, for example, right. uh, and the uh, uh, the college professors and so on, which they were the first ones to be in the concentration camps. Uh, then it was easy, and so I constantly preach here in uh, in Cortland, wherever I get a, a chance to, uh, to talk and give the speech, how dangerous it is for anybody to get a, a foothold, and how uh, I'm a, a civil liberties. Uh, right. not, oh, we, we just have to uh, protect uh, everybody, and my current hobby horse is the uh, what's happening to the uh, to the gays, and yeah. so I've been uh, at our Rotary Club, for example. I shocked everybody up. A couple of months ago, by bringing uh, uh, two uh, uh, men and two uh, women, gays and lesbians, from Cornell, well, you to, sound, to expose uh, you know yeah. mainstream uh, right. people, they don't right. know what the hell is, uh, yeah. is going on. But the fear of the stranger is so yeah. terrible. How would you characterize once the uh, work day is done there in that in that early phase again? Because yeah. my book isn't going beyond that. But how would you characterize the social life in there? Well, got it all uh, was around the Grand Hotel. Yeah. <laughs> I remember watching. You, you got bored night after night. The you know the entertainment. The uh, what the hell was the name of the room there? The marble room. The marble room. Yeah. Oh jeez, they were either German acrobats or uh, or uh, you know the same kind of entertainment over and over again. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, you had uh, cocktails and champagne was dinner and it was it was pretty nice living. Yeah, war is hell. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. A couple of background questions. What's your date of birth? 10, 26, 18. And um, where were you born and raised? Born in Tamaqua, T-A-M-A-Q-U-A, which is a little coal region town in Pennsylvania. Yep. And I had a year at Blair Academy, and then I uh, went to Princeton. Yep. And uh, Princeton, 1940, and then uh, Yale Law School. 